Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Lunch with the Experts, a Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Ibsen Biopharmaceuticals. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host this week and every week. And I'm a filmmaker and writer by trade that's been working with CCF for 10 years, a little bit over 10 years to be exact, uh, creating all kinds of video content, live video series like the one you're going to watch today, uh, documentaries about patients, telling patient stories, treatment-based videos, event coverage, all kinds of videos, but all with the same mission in mind, and that is to, to spread awareness and education about neuroendocrine tumors. That is what we are here to do. Um, if you are new to this journey, if you are new to this show, say hello, let us know where you, where you are signing on from, and the reason we do that is because this, this program, the value of this program is really twofold. One, the information you're going to get from our guests today, and two, the, the shared experiences and shared stories from the community. I promise you this community will embrace you, so uh, take advantage of that, leverage that, introduce yourself, get to know everyone. Everyone here likes to take care of each other, and if you are a regular to the show, which I see some of you already chiming in, say hello, let us know where, where you are today. Uh, and how you're feeling and how excited you are about the show, because I know you are. Um, before we get started, we always want to thank our sponsor, Ibsen Biopharmaceuticals. Without their support, we couldn't do the show. So we really appreciate them always. And we have this disclaimer from them always as well, and that is that the opinions expressed by the guest presenters today, as well as the questions asked by you all, the audience at home, haven't been created or suggested ahead of time by the sponsors of Luncheon with the Experts, and CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of these views, opinions, or information that will be provided in the presentation. So audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guests and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. Okay, that's a lot of words, but really the, the, the takeaway message is that last line, we, I or our guest does not know your specific case. Uh, so... We're going to give you some general advice. We're going to give you some good answers to your questions, hopefully. But by all means, take that general advice and those answers back to your home team, which does know your, your specific case. Make the best plan and path forward for you because uh, I am not a medical expert, but if there's anything I've learned in the past 10 years of working with CCF is that each case of this disease is unique and therefore each plan and path forward is as well. Uh, today, we have a unique show and I'm very excited to welcome to the show, Tamia Altuba. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you, Rain. Yeah, thank you for being here very, very much. Uh, for those that may not be familiar with uh, who you are, where you work, what you do, tell us a little bit about yourself. And uh, as I like to say, the role that you fill in this neuroendocrine tumor community. Thank you. So I, um, I started off about 10 years ago uh, in clinical research. Uh, I was a pre-medical student and I got my undergraduate degree in biomedical sciences and psychology. Um, and when I was interning in research, I realized that I, I knew that I wanted to be a physician, but I knew that I also wanted to teach, educate, and get into clinical research as a full-time um, career into academic medicine. And I wasn't sure exactly which niche I wanted to, to wind up in long-term, but I decided instead of going straight to medical school, I wanted to learn clinical research uh, in the, the most that I could uh, before going in and then being able to run my own trials on the flip side. I thought that was only going to last a few years, but I've been in this for about 10 years and uh, got my master's in public health along the way. Um, I started off working in pediatric uh, research, neonatology, and then for the last six years, I've been doing uh, oncology research. Uh, I started my first trial had, was with Dr. Strasberg, and that was my first insight into neuroendocrine tumors. Mm. And at the time, I was um, working in phase one clinical trials, so early phase, first in human trials, and I was seeing everything. So all solid tumors is what I treated in the beginning. Um, and two years into it, I decided, okay, neuroendocrine is exactly where I want to be, and I transitioned over to a full-time neuroendocrine clinical research position. Awesome. Well... Uh, I kind of chuckle because uh, what a great person to usher you into this world, Dr. Strasberg, yes. <laughs> who's, who's been on the show a couple of times. Definitely one of the rock stars of the, the net community, and we love him very much here at the show. Uh, I'm curious, how, you know, your interest in psychology, is that still there? Is that still something that you use it, or you're interested in? Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, the reason that I... 
I started off, I've, I've always been the the therapist of the bunch in my, in my friend group. Um, <laughs> right, and right. I, there's always I one. Defin- there's always one. And, and I always enjoyed, um, you know, looking at the, at the patient and the people in general as a whole, you know, everybody's so unique and everybody, you have to deal with every situation a little bit differently. So being able to have that background is, is definitely helpful in medicine. I think that separating psychology from physiology is not, um, is not conducive, I think, to a, a workplace at all. So it helps to be able to to have, you know, background in that and then be able to to apply a lot of that when I'm dealing with patients, dealing with providers, being able to figure out different personalities and different um, roles. As a coordinator, you're kind of the when I explain to people what we do, I'm like, you're the center of everything in in a clinical trial. And so you have to be able to navigate, well, I'm dealing with pharmaceutical companies and Mm -hmm. dealing with, you know, um, endpoints and I have deliverables for people and I have to, there's data that I have to kind of get in and there's deadlines and things like that. But then I'm also dealing with the patient side and this is real life and it's dealing with a human being, not just a, Hmm. you know, a number or a checkbox or anything like that. So that really helps, I think, bridge the, bridge the two. Well said. Um, so folks go ahead and start sending in your question. I see some of you already have, we're going to try our best to get to all of them, but we get a lot of questions every week. So inevitably we don't, the good problem, you know, it kind of creates a good problem. We can keep the show going every week, but I want to tell you that if you didn't get a question answered, or if you have a follow-up question, please reach out to CCF. This is, this is their job at the foundation to, to get you that information. So you can reach them here on the Facebook page. You can send them a private message or a direct message, or you can reach them at their website, uh, which is featured behind me at carsonoid.org. So go ahead and start sending in those questions. Uh, but a couple of things I want to ask you all to do, I do this every week besides saying hello and talking to each other about your own experiences, is uh, one, if you know someone that should be here, because really this interactive session, it, 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 that's the real value. The replay will, will be available for anybody who wants to rewatch it or that missed today. But it's really to help people that are struggling with a question or two questions or more uh, get those questions across to a specialist. So tag them in the comments if you know somebody that needs to be here to remind them the show is going on. And secondly, if you see a question in the sidebar in the comment section that you also have or you're interested in the answer to, you can like that. Uh, Facebook gives you a few emotions you can use, but they all work the same way for me. And that is to effectively upvote it. If I see eight people have that question as I'm going through the questions, I'll make sure to get that one across. I hope that makes sense. And it just helps me do my job a little bit better, which is, of course, to serve you. Uh, Tammy, I see someone who says, Bev says, hey, Tammy, from Melbourne. So I told you all over the world, they, they tune in. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to start churning through the questions. But first, I know that I wanted to learn a little bit more, uh, Tammy, about the, I know you have a couple of clinical trials at Moffitt going on right now. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what, what, you, what you're working on currently? Yeah, we have quite a few uh, ongoing clinical trials. I'll highlight a couple that um, either recently opened or that were really uh, ramping up accrual on. Um, One trial that's not actually a treatment trial, it's a pet dotatate trial. It's for patients uh, who have poorly differentiated neuroendocrine cancers. So the more aggressive uh, neuroendocrine tumor is, you know, we know that patients with poorly differentiated neuroendocrine cancers don't typically express somatostatin receptors. Mm -hmm. Um, But the trial is looking at uh, scanning patients with that histology to see, is it truly not seen often enough to warrant scanning them, or is there a higher percentage of patients that do express somatostatin receptors um, with poorly differentiated cancers and therefore maybe potentially change the, um, you know, the future moving forward, do we scan these patients just in case uh, and potentially open up a treatment option for them down the road with, uh, you know, Lutathera or something similar. Right. Um, so that's only being done at Moffitt. I need, I think we need about 15 more patients to, to be able to f- close that study out. So if you know anybody who has not had a pet dotatate in the past and you think meets that criteria, um, you guys are more than welcome to, to send an email over and, and we'll be happy to take a look at the, the records and, and go from there. We have a few other uh, trials. So the cabinet trial, that's the cabazantinib versus placebo trial. That's an alliance clinical trial. Uh, So government run protocol run all over the U.S. right now. Um, We've put on about nationally 200 of uh, 395 total patients that we want to enroll. Uh, That's a very exciting trial. 
patients will be blinded initially if they're eligible for the trial. So we don't know if you're on placebo or active treatment, uh, but we'll be closely monitoring you as you're on treatment. And if, if you progress on trial, we unblind. Uh, and, and if you're on placebo, you can cross over and get active drug as long as you're still you know, eligible for that. And then um, if you're on drug, then we know that it didn't work. So that's a, an interesting pivotal trial. Um, that will hopefully, if positive, lead to FDA approval of a new drug for the neuroendocrine tumor patients. Um, and then we have another exciting trial that just opened up. Uh, out, it's out of Alpha Medics. It's the Alpha Emitter uh, mm -hmm. PRRT. So that's that's been something I think we've all been hearing about, talking about, and it's finally uh, hit the ground running in a phase two clinical trial. So we have that open in Moffitt. Um, and one other trial that's opening up, that did open up recently at Moffitt and opened at many other sites across the world is the COMPOSE clinical trial. That's comparing uh, PRRT with lutetium dota talk mm. versus standard of care treatment that your physician can choose. So they can pick between Everolimus or Refinitor, um, Zalota and Timidar or Folfox. So different whatever is most appropriate in your case, your doctor would choose as the comparator. And patients are randomized one-to-one uh, -one on that trial. So uh, you would either be randomized to the PRRT or to the standard of care treatment that your doctor chose. Um, and that's for patients with grade uh, two or three. So KI-67 between 15 and 55%. Awesome. Well, thank you for all that, folks. We already laid some great foundation about trials uh, coming up. If you just joined us or joined us a little bit late, we are here with Tamia Altuba from Moffitt talking about trials and uh, research that she is working on. Uh, questions are already rolling in, so I'm going to go ahead and start taking sure. some. Uh, Rebecca says, hi from Liberty. It's been a while since I've uh, been able to join. So excited to be back. We're excited to have you, Rebecca. And she says, and also I want to give everybody else um, a little shout out for doing exactly what I asked. Several other people have this question and I can see that because you all liked it. Thank you very much. Rebecca says, what is your knowledge or opinion on the clinical trial of the pill form of, of uh, Sanostatin? So we're, we don't have that um, open. And I know there's several trials that I've seen come my way with that. Um, Opinion, I would leave to your physician to give an opinion on your specific case uh, with whether that would be appropriate or not. I think in general, um, it, it is definitely exciting uh, that we might have an option that's, that's oral for patients. I think the, the only thing that I would just think about if, you know, if I were in your shoes or just in general is, um, you know, what are your symptoms going into it and what are the, the requirements for enrollment? I know some of the trials allow you to stay on your existing somatostatin analog. So if you're on lanreotide or sandostatin already, that you can continue on that. And this would be an addition to see if it helped alleviate some of the symptoms. Um, and then there are others where you would stop your SSA and continue on the, on the oral by itself. So I think it depends on every unique case. It's definitely um, exciting. It just depends on how the study is designed uh, and what the what the goal of the study is. I think that's yeah. important with any trial is some trial, we have to kind of look at what is, what are we trying to prove with this? Are we trying to say that this is better than what the alternative is? Or are we saying that this can be a supplement to what we already have um, if it's not doing its job completely in your case? So, you know, if you have more symptoms toward the end of your cycle or things like that. Thank you so much. And thanks for your question, Rebecca. Good to see you again. Next question comes in from Pam. Pam says, how do you feel immunotherapy is coming along? We've talked about this a lot lately. It didn't go well for my husband. Any progress that you can see? Are there any clinical trials that are better right now? So with immunotherapy, we're, we know that um, we've, or what has been published so far is uh, patients with well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, um, immunotherapy on its own does not seem to, to work for that patient population. We have several trials right now that are combining immunotherapy with um, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, so linbatinib or cabozantinib. Um, we had a trial at Moffitt, linbatinib and, uh, and pembrolizumab, and then uh, or Keytruda. And then Dana Farber has a study where they're doing cabozantinib with Optivo. So that's similar, uh, a similar regimen there. Um, there. Neither study is published yet, uh, but the, the idea is that combining immunotherapy with another agent that we know works a little bit better in this population may help 
get the immunotherapy to work. Um, we know for poorly differentiated neuroendocrine cancers, the biology is different. And for those, we're seeing some responders, but we haven't been able to, to figure out exactly who is most likely to respond. So a lot of us are working right now collectively on um, combining data from different institutions. So, you know, Moffitt, Mayo, you know, all the big cancer centers coming together and pooling their data together to kind of look at the patients that we've treated and seeing if there's anything we can, um, we can tell for sure uh, is a, an indicator for who's going to respond. I think, I think immunotherapy has a huge role in cancer in general, right? Not just neuroendocrine cancer, right. um, but it's going to take a, a lot more time to, to figure out exactly who is most appropriate uh, for this. I think if there's a clinical trial available to you that you're eligible for, um, it, it's definitely something that if your doctor's offering to you is something to, to consider because the more, the more we know, the more we'll be able to advance the field in that, in that avenue. And through a clinical trial is always, um, we get more clean data, if you will, uh, on, on what that really looks like versus when, uh, you know, if we write, we can prescribe these medications off trials, uh, sometimes if that's appropriate. Uh, but that, that doesn't give us, uh, super clean data moving forward. Right. Well, thanks for your question. We're going to keep moving forward. This, uh... This is a treatment-based question, so I'm, I'm going to ask it. We'll talk about it a little bit and see what you think. Um, the question is from Jennifer. Why do they not usually offer as much treatment for lung nets? I'm not sure if she means as many options, but any thoughts on that or any research going on specifically for the lung nets? So the cabazantinib trial, the cabinet trial, and then the alpha medics trial, both are uh, for all neuroendocrine tumors that are well differentiated. So the biology is different between lung neuroendocrine tumors and gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And so it's, I think a lot of the trials, um, particularly like the Lutathera trials um, that initially, you know, the Netter one trial, um, those were focused on that patient population, but there, I think that's changing. I think a lot of the clinical trials that are open now, you'd, you'd be surprised how many include lung nets or unknown primaries. Um, it's, it's just, different when you look back at the data. A lot of times you can't apply what applies to the GI nets to the lung nets. And so that's right. where having trials that are more inclusive of that patient population, that, that that's changing now. They're even doing PRRT in um, lung nets that express somatostatin receptors. But we have to think about um, the fact that lung neuroendocrine tumors don't always light up the same way that GI nets do on the PET scans. So treatments that would be easily effective in theory for patients like that uh, wouldn't necessarily be the same for lung nets. So you wouldn't wanna treat a patient who all their tumors didn't light up with a treatment, for example, that, that is targeted towards that. So um, the targeted therapies and, and the newer um, trials are, are definitely including lung or endocrine tumors where appropriate. Got it. Thanks. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, and thanks for your question. Uh, next from Rebecca, uh, what's coming down the pipeline for grade one METS uh, stage four? I, all these trials. So everything includes uh, that I've mentioned, at least the, the alpha medics trial, the cabinet trial, um, those include grade one neuroendocrine tumors that have metastasized. But what you, we have to think about too with clinical trials is if you still have options that are standard of care options, mm -hmm. that limits the likelihood that you would be eligible for a trial. So the less aggressive um, neuroendocrine tumors, we have lots of options for already. Uh, so for example, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, you have Affinitor, you have Sutent, you have PRRT, um, you have a CAPTEM. We have a lot of options already at our disposal that a doctor may want to explore first before going to a clinical trial. So it may not be that they're not available. It may just be that not appropriate um, at the time that, that you were interested in a trial, for example. Um, phase one clinical trial, so that's uh, disease agnostic trials, if you will. Uh, okay. Those are usually open to anybody with any solid tumor, if that's the, the way that it's written. Um, that's what I did for a while. The 
the hard part about uh, about phase one trials is that there's limited slots. So a lot of these studies are either first in human or first time we're using a drug in a new uh, cancer. And so it's a very careful, carefully thought out trial and patients, we're not just enrolling 100 patients right away. You're enrolling pac patients in batches um, to make sure that it's safe, uh, that patients are not exhibiting any significant toxicities or side effects that would warrant uh, changing course uh, or maybe not developing the drug further, things like that. Um, I know clinicaltrials.gov can be very overwhelming. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it might seem sometimes like there are not options, um, but I would, I would say, you know, I like to be this for my patients and I hope that you can, you know, you're welcome to, if, you, if you're a Moffitt patient or you're interested in becoming a Moffitt patient, I'm, you know, I'm happy to help coordinate that for you, but your physicians too, and anybody at your institution, if you ask, people are more than willing to help you navigate that, you know, clinicaltrials.gov and, and, and try to help you find something that's, that's appropriate for you. Got it. Thanks. Um, hey, do you mind if we go back a little bit? And we've talked about phase one uh, quite yeah. a bit and, and just lay a little bit of like groundwork or foundation for someone who just completely is not sure about, you know, the whole process. And just could you break down kind of the different phases and, and like what a clinical trial, like the, the whole process? I mean, Absolutely. I know that's a big, a big question, yeah. but yeah. All right, no, cool. that's, <laughs> that's great. So, uh, so clinical trial in general, uh, if we just want to briefly define that, it's going to be a drug uh, that we're using in an indication where it's not approved typically, yeah. or that we're looking to lead. We know that a drug maybe works or was shown to work in a small population of patients, but we need more data to prove that it works more effectively than the alternative that's on the market right now or then nothing if we don't have anything as an alternative. So drugs go through different phases. Um, Preclinical phases would be pre-phase one. So that's when you're developing a drug and you're in the lab and trying to figure all of that out. Phase one trials uh, can be one of two things. So they can be first time that we're using a drug in human beings. So it's just been in the lab, it's just been in mice before, um, animals, what have you, and now we're using it in human trials. Uh, and those trials are usually what you'll hear words like dose escalation or dose expansion. A dose escalation portion of a trial will be when we're trying to find what is the maximum tolerated dose that we can give to patients that does not cause side effects that are, be that are beyond what we think is acceptable. Mm -hmm. And th that is different for each type of drug. So, you know, chemotherapy has different thresholds than targeted therapy, than immunotherapy, things like that. So every protocol is specific, but usually what happens with those, a standard study would be, uh, let's say we start at, you know, one milligram. I'm just giving random numbers here. Um, and we enroll three patients in that first cohort or dose level, if you will. And if none of those three patients have the side effects that we consider unacceptable, we move on to the next dose level. And we keep doing that until we hit either the maximum dose that we had expected to hit, or that we hit a dose level where patients start having side effects that are teetering on that edge. Um, in which case, what we usually do is we pause, we first address the patients that are on treatment, and then we expand that cohort itself. So we might add three more patients or two more patients, depending on how the, the protocol was written, and see, was this just a one-off? Was it just one patient that had this side effect? Um, or did more patients in that dose level have that same side effect that pushed them over the edge? In which case, we go down a dose level, and that's where we stop. That's it. We don't keep going anymore. Um, that then expands to a dose expansion cohort. And sometimes those are separate trials. Sometimes it's within the same clinical trial. So when that happens, we enroll now a larger number of patients at that maximum dose that we discovered in the first part of the trial. Um, usually, I mean, depending on what type of trial it is, it could be 20 patients, it could be 10 patients, it could be you know, 50 patients. Um, and there are some phase one trials that are disease agnostic. So as long as you have a solid tumor that meets X, Y, Z criteria, you would be eligible. Um, and sometimes they're drugs that we know definitely won't work in a certain type of cancer. So they're written for a specific type only. So maybe only GI cancers, only neuroendocrine cancers, only lung, something like that. Um, 
Phase two is when we know a drug is safe. Now we wanna see is the drug, uh, does it have any efficacy? Does it work at all? So we might have some of that data from a phase one trial, right? That happens sometimes. Yes, it's safe. And yes, we know that it's working in this patient population, but now we need to look at it a little bit more closely. Um, so phase two would be, usually it runs from 50 to 200 patients, depending on the study. Um, and that's where you expand on the, the data you have from that phase one trial and enroll uh, patients. Uh, basically you have one cutoff and most of the time in the middle of the study where you say, okay, once I hit this benchmark, I look at all the data. If we have X number of patients who responded to this treatment, then this warrants further uh, enrollment. And we open that up and we continue to enroll. If not, then we stop and we publish and we say, hey, this, you know, we thought it was gonna work. It did, but not, not enough to warrant keeping to keep going. Phase three happens after a phase two study is usually positive. So we know that the drug works, we know that it's safe. Now we wanna see, does it work better than the alternative? And so that's where cab like the cabozantinib trial is at. We had a phase two trial that did well. We saw that um, you know, patients were at their progression-free survival or the time to progression on treatment was about 22 months. Um, for reference, Afinitor, Sutint are about 11 months. So that was very exciting. So then it moved to the phase three study. And now if this proves to be better than placebo um, in this case and meets a certain benchmark with the number of months that we saw in the first study, um, then that would lead, you would apply for FDA approval of the drug. I hope that I, helps. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, that was perfect. Super thorough. I appreciate it. Um, next question from Karen uh, and a few other people. What site can we go on to to see results of trial studies and other treatments? Clinicaltrials.gov. Any trial that was registered on there um, has to be published. Uh, the results have to be published there once they're available. So in the same link that you would find the trial itself, there's a study results tab. You would press on that. And sometimes they publish the results right on there. Sometimes they have a link to the article on PubMed. So you could just click on that and it'll take you there. Got it. Thanks. Uh, question from Jesse. What are the options for patients with both receptor positive and receptor negative tumors? That That's a broad yes. question. Yeah. <laughs> um, but... Um. I, I, again, like, you know, Rain and I were saying, I defer specific questions to your doctor specifically, but yeah. with a mixed, a mixed uptake, you can expect that unless it's on a clinical trial, you know, something like Ludothera would not be mm -hmm. a typical, um, typical option. So that's where more other systemic therapies are usually appropriate. Got it. Thank you. Um, and Jesse, or, or this goes for anyone, if you have any follow-up questions, uh, and you're still on the call, please chime in, chime in later. From Eva, can patients with other comorbidities like autoimmune disease, diabetes, other disease, et cetera, uh, can they also be eligible for clinical trials? Absolutely. I think um, this, the, I, I'm glad you brought that question up mm -hmm. because it, it brings me to eligibility in general. And I think there's a lot of confusion on that. There's a lot of frustration on the patient's part with eligibility, which I can completely understand. Um, it depends on the treatment, right? So if you have an autoimmune history and the trial is an immunotherapy drug, then no, that would be in most mm -hmm. cases an exclusion. And the reason for something like that would be well, in this case, if you have this history, giving you this drug is gonna cause more harm than good. So mm -hmm. it will you know, reactivate potentially whatever autoimmune disease you have or cause something that you have to worsen. And then, and then you're battling, you know, we might be treating the cancer, but we're also causing a whole lot more damage in everything else going on with you. So that, that would be um, a situation where exclusion, we would not be eligible for a trial. So exclusion criteria is designed to keep you, the patient, safe. Um, mm -hmm. I know it can seem like, you know, I'm being excluded from a trial, um, but I, the way I, I like to, to talk about that with patients is it, it's not excluding you from the trial because we don't think you're good for the trial. It's that we don't think this trial is going to do good for you in, in the way that you're presenting. So, you know, labs, for example, some of these trials have very strict labs. Uh, that you have to meet to be eligible. And again, that's a safety mechanism that's put in place to make sure we don't give you a drug that's going to then make things that much worse for you and cause other issues that we now have to 
focus on and then your cancer ends up falling to the wayside because we can't address things like that. Same thing with cardiac history, things like that. Got it. Hey, thanks for your question, Eva. Um, let's see. From Gina, any new tests available to find a suspected primary net after lymph nodes removals of, of metastasized net cancer lung area? Um, I'm not sure that's... Did you catch that? Yeah, I mean... I think, I think what I'm getting is that you're asking if there's like a blood test or yeah, a, a screening test or something like that. Yeah. Um, nothing that is currently in practice right okay. now. Okay. Uh, and Gina, again, this applies to anyone. Uh, if, if I misunderstand a question or anything like that, and you're still in the call, please, please chime back in and, and give me some, uh, some clarity. Uh, I wanted to go back a little bit. You had said, you know, this is also after working with uh, Dr. Strasberg, so I do, mm -hmm. I do somewhat get it. Um, but you said, like, a, a, you know, after that point, you knew that nets was was you know what you wanted to work on or work in specifically. What is what is it about, or what was it about nets that you were like, this is this, this is, is it. this is the thing. <laughs> Neuroendocrine tumors are so uh, diverse in in right. from in aggression. So you know you have the super indolent, very low grade tumors, and then you have the very aggressive, you know, poorly differentiated cancers. Um, and I think with a lot seeing all the different types of cancers that I worked in, neuroendocrine was the one field that I felt one was growing very quickly, um, and two because of the fact that neuroendocrine cancers, for the most part, neuroendocrine tumors tend to be a chronic thing that we're dealing with for decades sometimes. Um, it gives you a lot of opportunity to further the field, to do more research. It gives you time to, to, to develop drugs and to develop treatments for these patients um, that I don't feel we're not there yet with other cancers. You know, when you're right. dealing with pancreatic adenocarcinomas, for example, you're you're in damage control, you know, yeah. mode almost all the time. You know, patients are very sick, and the research they're doing is incredible. Don't, I'm not saying that to minimize any sure. other field, but I do like the 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 pace that the neuroendocrine tumor um, uh, disease, just in general, works at. I think the biology helps us helps give us time to to really refine the treatments. You you have time to to think an individualized treatment for each patient. Yeah, that's a really good point that I hadn't thought of. Uh, kind of seeing the long term, like that way you can you can analyze like long term treatment mm -hmm. as well as short term, you know, because yeah. you have both of those to consider. Like you said, when you're in this kind of like, you know, what did you call? I mean, you didn't say triage, but when you're just kind like of damage, this yeah. yeah, damage control is what you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's one thing, and you're trying to treat those symptoms and help that patient feel better. But now of this, this, like you said, when it can be managed a little more long-term, you can kind of see, okay, well, what is it like five years down the road, 10 years down the road and, and see your work work, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. That's a really, yeah. that's, that's a great point. Uh, I, I'm always interested in that because, uh, you know, I know people, you don't just, most people I would guess don't uh, start off like I'm going into neuroendocrine, yeah. the of neuroendocrine. <laughs> like there is usually a story on how you got there and why, and it's often like the challenge, which you alluded yeah. to as well. Uh, so that's always an interesting one for me, uh, from Gwendolyn are, are the side effects to alpha comparable to traditional PRRT? We talked about so, alpha a little bit. Yeah. I can talk about what I've been told because I haven't, right. you know, we haven't treated our first patient yet. Um, our first patient's coming up very soon. So we're excited for that. But um, I've had uh, a patient of mine that had, had treated and the side effects were for her specifically were worse than, than with traditional Ludothera. Um, but to say that is based on one patient that I have experience with, right? Um, it should be based on what you know, Dr. Del Bassan's group and the research and the literature that we have out there, um, in the short term, they're seeing more side effects than we do with traditional PRRT because of the, of the way that the, the drug works and the intensity of the drug short term. So, um, you know, they've noted more nausea than with Ludothera. We're not seeing a lot with the new amino acids that we give patients now. Um, it, more nausea, some hair loss is something that they've mentioned. Um, 
uh, and the blood counts uh, more acutely dipping than with PRRT. But this is in a, a, about 22 to 25 patients worth of data. So very small numbers um, that we have. Uh, and I think the, you know, this study, we're enrolling 34 total patients across three or four sites. Um, that will give us a little bit better of an idea of that. Got it. Thanks. Um, I have another question that's kind of test oriented to it. We may have, mm -hmm. have already addressed it, but I'm going to ask it because several people have this question and you've been doing a great job of like, even if it's not, if it's not specifically what you do day to day of like giving great value. So I'm going to ask it. Let's see what we can do. Nancy says chromogranin A appears to be a poor screening lab test for NETS. It was unchanged for me for years while I was developing multiple liver, liver metastases. Is there any newer, more accurate blood marker on the horizon? I mean, right now, um, you know, we're looking, we, we've done research with the NET test. That's something that we're continuing to, to work on. Um, if you have a functional neuroendocrine tumor, we have other options for tumor markers. So, you know, if you have a functional tumor that, um, it, you know, serotonin producing, so the urine 5-HIA is usually a better marker than chromogranin. If you have a gastronoma, the gastrin level is usually a better marker than a chromogranin. Um, a VIPOMA, which is rare, but happens, you know, we have different levels. Um, insulinomas, checking your pro-insulin level, things like that. So if you have a functional tumor, we know those there are easier ways of tracking um, at least tumor pr hormone production, which tends to correlate with progression. Um, in trials, the NET test is something, like I said, that they're, we're exploring. We've done trials on it. Other institutions are. Um, it, it, it's not, we're not yet at the point where it's incorporated into all practices, but that's, mm -hmm. it's heading in that um, direction for some people. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're working on right now, a predictive biomarker for patients who will respond to PRRT. So in conjunction with the NET test, Dr. Baudet's group has developed the PPQ. Um, so that's a, another study we have that we're doing with Sloan Kettering, Moffitt and Sloan Kettering are doing this right now. Um, and we're enrolling patients that are starting Ludothera and collecting blood at each of the treatments and then for the scans that you do afterwards um, to see if we can identify who will respond to PRRT before we even give it. So I think it, we're, we're getting there. We're trying. Um, we're looking at more than just um, more than just scans. We're trying to expand that, but it's a, it's a slow growth in that. Got you. Um, so you had mentioned insulin, insulinomas, uh, and Jan, Jean, Jan, um, had a question. Do functional insulinomas ever become non-functional? I, I haven't seen functional insulinomas going non-functional, but I have seen the reverse. So non-functional tumor then becoming functional. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I haven't seen that many of them in general, but I'm sure that the, that can happen and it may not so much be as non, not functional. It could just be that your levels just stop fluctuating. Um, mm. But we would still be treating you, uh, you know, depending on your symptoms. It could just be that, that the tumor maybe that was causing the most issues for you is not causing those same issues. Got it. I have a comment from Karen that says, thank you for explaining the answers so well. Uh, I totally agree with that, which is why I'm glad I Thank asked you. the, the chromogranin A uh, question and all of these questions. But speaking of that uh, previous response to the chromogranin A question, you mentioned net test. Uh, can, can you lay a little bit of foundation for that? Like what exactly is the net test? I get questions about it all the week. I know people uh, all every week. I mean, and I know people are interested in like, what exactly is that? Is that what are your thoughts on it? I know it's still kind of, you know, the new kid on the block in a, in a sense. Yeah, I mean, the NET test is a bio, blood biomarker um, designed to uh, predict, it, it's used in different functions. So um, in some cases, they've looked at whether it um, can predict recurrence in patients that have had resected disease. Um, and in others, it's to see whether patients are progressing or not in a, in a blood biomarker. And it's a more, uh, it's looking at several different um, markers of cancer in general, mm -hmm. um, that when combined, give us a score and that score is then 
a, an indicator for whether you're, um, you know, on the higher spectrum or lower spectrum of progression or aggression or, or what have you. Um, I, I mean, I don't, I can't say that I have a personal opinion one way or the other um, on that. I think that uh, anything new, uh, we need to keep testing in until we know for sure that we can implement into practice. And sometimes, um, in general, you sometimes you need to implement things to get more data to be able to then say, oh, you know, this is a good idea or this is not to on its own. Right. So these are we want to think of biomarkers in general as tools, um, not the end all be all to, to progression or not. So I don't think that, you know, I don't think at any point we're ever going to get to where we just follow disease with a blood biomarker in any cancer. Right. We're, we're at all. Um, but we can use it as a tool in conjunction with a scan uh, to help us kind of guide decisions, just like we do in other cancers, where maybe we check the blood biomarker more frequently than we do a scan. And then if we see it creeping up, maybe we scan sooner than we would have otherwise. Um, or we do it at the same time that we get scans. And if there's a huge disproportionate, you know, the scans look great, but the blood biomarker has shot way up. Mm -hmm. Do we then maybe need to do a different scan um, or do we need to look at, you know, what else could be going on um, that's causing that? So I think the net test, other tests like so we have um, Signatera, which is uh, used in colorectal cancer, but we're looking at it and potentially implementing in neuroendocrine tumors. Okay. Um, there's different biomarkers out there that uh, try to to help aid uh, in us figuring out where patients are at. So. Think of it as a one more tool that we add to to our yeah. toolbox. I think that's such a great way to 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 look at it. What you said, like this is just a tool, not not the end all end all be all. Um, and folks, uh, just a reminder, I kind of alluded to this earlier in the show, in the beginning of just all the video content that we've that we've created here. There's a huge library, a huge database of videos. Uh, about this disease that we've that we've generated here you can go to the videos tab on facebook you can go to our youtube channel uh, i mean i don't know how many episodes we've been doing this show for a couple of years but specifically i'm, I'm talking about the net test uh i think the very first episode of lunch and the experts was was with dr Irvin modlin uh, from ren laboratories who created the net test so i would start there and, and the reason i take an opportunity to always ask our guest about that is because you all always ask about it. Um, so that's a good place to start um, is going back and finding the very first uh, lunch of the experts. And you can hear, you know, from him, we may have him back on the show. And this also just applies on a, a broader macro level too. Uh, we have had nutritionists and, and, and pathologists and literally every, everybody across the board on the show. And we have other videos. So, uh, if you're new to the space, to the Carson Cancer Foundation uh, community, I definitely encourage you to look look through those videos. There, there are that we've covered a lot of ground, uh, and that specifically one uh, I know that we have touched on with Dr. Dr. Modlin. So, hope that helps. Michael says, you know, I often compare a net to an errant gland. How come no one else uses that comparison? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I Anybody like else want to chime in on that? Thanks, Michael. Good to see you again. Um, what, do, what should a patient consider? What should they think about when going into a clinical trial? I know there might be sometimes some fear associated with it or, or you know, of the unknown, mm -hmm. like going into, you know, if it's a first time patient, what should, what are the things they should consider or think about? I think from the beginning, uh, don't make a decision very quickly. Um, when we give you the, I know a lot of patients, um, you know, you have flips, you have some patients that walk in they're like, okay, they panic when they hear, oh, I'm progressing and a trial is being offered to me. And so the first reaction is, okay, can we get started today? Um, others want to mull it over and think about it for a while. I think somewhere in the middle there is, don't go into panic when, when you hear um, trial. It's not, especially now, especially in the neuroendocrine field and especially uh, the way that we are conducting research at this point in, in, in time. Um, a trial is an option uh, that you have the control of, of making a yes or no decision to read through that consent um, ask questions up front. It, mm -hmm. that, that is your time. Uh, you're never 
asking too many questions. Um, if you if you feel uncomfortable with something, don't don't move forward until you feel that your questions have been answered. And those questions being answered doesn't necessarily mean I'm completely at ease with the answers. It's just I am now aware of what what is happening, right? We might not ever be completely comfortable with any treatment that we go on because it's all scary. Um, you know, Fair FDA point. approved or not, it's all something new. So think of it just like you would any other treatment that's being offered to you. Um, know that your physicians are, and you know, for the most part, physicians are offering something that they think is of benefit to you. Um, we would never keep a patient on a trial or offer a patient to a trial that uh, that we didn't think was going to offer benefit potentially. Um, and that benefit may not be known, right? We, we never give a drug hoping that it doesn't work. We're, we're hoping that it works. We're hoping that um, it can help us advance the field in whichever direction that we go. Um, communication too, when you're going on a trial, uh, identify a point person, because what happens when you go on a trial is now there are a million and one new things that you have to think about. Um, and depending on the, the, the degree of the trial that you're, you're going on, sometimes you have visits every week, sometimes you have visits every other week. Um, there are new side effects that you're not expecting, things like that. Uh, identify one point person and ask that person, you know, how do you best communicate? Um, I think that's important is figuring out, you know, if, if you're my patient and I'm your coordinator, I tell you email is the best way to communicate with me because I'm constantly checking my email. So that's me telling you, this is how I'm available to you um, to help you get the answers that you need. So identify what that method of communication is mm -hmm. uh, because you can go into something like this and then be calling somebody and then not getting an answer, thinking that person is ignoring you, for example. Um, and that may not be the case. It may just be a communication issue. This is, you know, this is not the primary mode of communication or I'm not at my desk on these days, things like that. So I think the logistic things, um, if you iron out the logistic parts of being on a trial up front, that can, I've seen significantly ease uh, anxiety while on treatment um, and just make things a lot easier for you as a patient to handle. Yeah, you know, I've walked into, I've taken over patients from others and you can, you know, patients are frustrated and things like that. You have a conversation with the patient and okay, I ask you what, how do you communicate? And you ask me the same thing. And most of the time, 90% of the issues are gone in that, in just that, that. that conversation. So um, just commute on your part. That's really all you as a patient can do is show up answer the questions and ask the questions that you need and communicate with your with your team on our end just know that those extra visits those extra labs those extra us calling you and bugging you is us trying to check in on you and making sure that um, everything is going the way that it should be for you sometimes side effects on trials that might seem minor to you are actually more significant than you think um, because maybe you've had the side effect with a different treatment but we shouldn't be seeing it with this that often, for example. And so um, we're not trying to panic you. We're just trying to, to keep a close eye out um, on you. So there's a lot, I think that's a comforting thing mm -hmm. is on a trial, you're going to be a lot more closely monitored than you would be otherwise. So it's a great point too. And folks at home, I can confirm about the emails. Uh, she is very fast in responding <laughs> <laughs> and that is appreciated. Um, you mentioned at the beginning of the, um, like when you're in, during your intro, the beginning of the program, that you said that you were kind of the center of everything in the clinical trial. Can we go back and expand that a little bit? Like, because I think that's such a good point. And there are a lot of moving parts and pieces, yes. right? Like, what are those moving parts and pieces? It reminds me of, we talk a lot about multidisciplinary teams here and the importance mm -hmm. of that. It kind of reminds me of the same thing. There's just a lot of different players in that, in that, in that game, so to speak. It absolutely is. I think you have to. Th your coordinator at most most institutions is communicate is the so they come, they see you, they consent you, and now they're responsible for everything to do with you and keeping everybody else in line. Right. So to compare a standard of care versus a trial, a trial um, treatments are 
run through a different pharmacy than they are every other treatment in the hospital. There's mm -hmm. a separate team that receives the drug that has to order the drug. There are separate checks for the drug. So on a trial, when you're waiting for your treatment to, to come out and you're like, why is this taking an hour and a half? Usually it's out in, you know, in the regular infusion center in 20 minutes. It's because they quite literally have to check each drug, like three people have to sign off on the physical bottle before it even gets to the patient. Um, there's paperwork that has to be filled out. There's a lot of quality control checks, a lot of logistics with just that aspect. Um, we have to communicate with your nursing staff who are different than your clinical nursing staff. You have separate nurses for a trial. Um, we have different systems for clinical trials for ordering things. You don't order things the same. Your doctor can't just place the orders the way they do for a regular treatment visit or a regular follow-up visit. There is a protocol that's what we call our Bible, and it's you know usually 200 to 400 pages long sometimes, um, and that outlines every little specific thing that has to happen on the trial, how, which labs we draw when, when we you know when we do vitals, when we do an EKG, what position you have to be in for an EKG. Things it's very very nuanced, and um, you know so we have to coordinate all of that with the staff. If it's a nuclear medicine trial, I'm coordinating between the company that's shipping me the drug, the pharmacy, the nursing staff, the nuclear medicine team that's administering the drug, the safety, you know, the, you know, the, the staff that's going to be marking off the bathroom and making sure that you have your own bathroom for the day. Um, all of that, making sure that you're, so when you report side effects to me, I have to then communicate with your physician and then figure out, you know, facilitate, okay, this patient's having this side effect. Uh, we need, we, this is what the protocol says. This is what we're, you know, typically seeing. This is what we're not. And then we have to document everything. So everything that we do, uh, in addition to documenting, just like the physicians do in a chart. So I do my own notes and, and, and chart that way. We also have ancillary forms. So your, your radiology reports are being transcribed into a separate form and then being entered by a data manager. So I'm, I'm responsible for creating those forms. Every single side effect that you have, every fluctuation in blood pressure, we have to capture on a separate form, go you know meet with the doctors, have all of that um, attributed, assigned, um, and then sent over to data management. And then we deal with the pharmaceutical company at the same time. We do deal with the regulatory documents, which are um, you know, approvals by ethics committees and by scientific review committees to make sure that everything that we hand to you or that we're doing related to the trial is approved. So these are not stepwise things. These all happen simultaneously. Um, and so that, when I say center, I mean that you're, you're, you're like one person with 10 hands, um, making sure that all the people who don't actually, none of them communicate with each other. They only communicate with right. you. You're yep. just having to <laughs> close the loop. Absolutely. It's such a vital, vital position. Uh, and I thank you for what you do, but also so does Ronald who says, thank you for all the work you're doing in clinical trials. It's such a huge collaboration in so many areas. Thank you. <laughs> Without dedicated doctors and researchers, the net community would have little hope to look into the future and, and be hopeful for. We all appreciate you and lots of other people uh, agreed with that as well. Thank you. Um, from our friend Fernando. Hello, I'm a stage four and what I have heard from other doctors is that if you do decide to do a trial, that stage fours do not get placebos. That's what I would be. Uh, that's what I would be afraid of. Uh, the placebo is that how that works? Depending on depending on the stage, is that how that works? Uh, I'd be afraid that my tumors would progress if stage doesn't matter, uh, and all get placebo. I might have lost yeah. a little bit in translation. I think the so placebo is a concern for um, a lot of patients. Mm -hmm. What I will say is we. You will never get placebo if we don't disclose that up front. So unless we state that you're getting placebo, you're not getting placebo. Um, a placebo controlled trial is usually, I mean, it can be any stage cancer, depending on what we're looking at. So stage doesn't define um, whether you can get placebo or not. The design of the trial will. So if we're looking at approval for a drug like the cabazantinib trial, that's for stage four patients um, who have progressed on a standard of care treatment uh, and now are eligible for this. That said, a lot of the placebo controlled studies um, have crossover at a certain time point and they're typically designed for patients that are not experiencing rapid progression. So if you're, um, 
if your cancer is progressing rapidly, I, very little chance that a physician would offer a placebo controlled trial to you. It's mainly reserved um, for patients who either we have absolutely no other option for sometimes. And then other times it's for patients who, if you were to be on placebo for three months, we would not expect significant growth um, that would, you know, would put you in danger uh, mm -hmm. of being off treatment. So the stage is not, it's the indication that, that would dictate whether it was a placebo controlled trial or not. Got it. Thank you for that. And thanks, Fernanda, for your question. Hopefully that helped. Uh, let me know if not, or if you have a follow-up question. Um, there's so much, you know, we've alluded to this indirectly and directly today. There's so much activity going on right now in this mm -hmm. space. And there's been a lot that's happened in the past 10 years since I've been working with CCF. But right now, like looking forward to the next couple, two to three to five years, it's like a flurry of activity happening, which is exciting. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what is something that, what do you need? What are you looking for that would help you do your, your job better? Like what is exciting to you? Where, you know, where are you hoping that we drive things that could really make us take that ne next set of leaps and bounds? I think, um, so a few things, I think COVID has opened the door to things like virtual visits and mm -hmm. virtual, um, uh, you know, telehealth, doing labs locally, things like that. What I need when I have a patient who we can do something like that for mm -hmm. is for consistency on both ends. Um, so if, if, if you can, we can do that as long as patients stay consistent and sticking to timelines and things like that, that's been the hesitation with, um, with companies and with protocols in general is, you know, if we can make sure that things are happening still as strict as they do when we're in clinic, we can make things easier for patients and mm. have things happen um, at home, which I am a huge advocate for. Anything that I can do to make things easier on you as a patient, I'm happy to do, but it's a collaboration. Um, I like to think that we're all, we're all on the same team, right? The patients, the providers, all of that. So um, more patient involvement uh, in, in helping to communicate things like, you know, what is and what isn't working for you on a trial. That, that helps, feedback helps. Um, and with regard just to the industry in general, I think flexibility is something that, that, that's helpful, flexibility in, in the structure of these trials um, and minimizing things that are not necessary to the outcome of the trial. That's something that we try, you know, if I'm able to, I try really hard to, advocate to get rid of things and protocols that don't need to happen necessarily if they don't really help us answer a question at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and then resources. Trials are expensive. Uh, they're very, very, very expensive. We love writing our own protocols and running trials out of institutions. Um, but to fund those, I mean, we, you know, we have donations sometimes, and that's incredible. Um, other times you have pharmaceutical backing, um, but increasing the funding for, for clinical trials and making things more if efficient to, to yeah. operate. Definitely. Always. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we were talking about it before we started recording, uh, some of the th positive things that have come out of the pandemic and this show right here that you're watching folks is a baby a child of the pandemic so one of the things that we're we're happy has hap uh, has happened and it looks like the people are as well thank you tamia uh for everything that you do we appreciate we all appreciate you thank you so much for an informative session much appreciated the people are speaking I totally thank agree. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you spending the hour with us and giving such uh, such valuable for information, but also it's the way you deliver it. And someone said it earlier, and I totally agree with that. Like, this can be a lot for people. It's a lot of information. It can be confusing. It can be scary. So, like, being able to digest simply understood information is vital. So, I appreciate you sharing thank your you knowledge so with much. us. Absolutely, we appreciate thank you. Thank you, and and thank you to all the patients. I mean, we are nothing without you. You guys quite literally, I, I told a patient the other day, you're the only reason that keep us going some days. Um, mm. Not because we want you to have cancer, but because mm -hmm. you, you absolutely, uh, you, you are an inspiration and you, you really make our lives better in a way that I don't think we can communicate to you eloquently in words. 
I love it. It's a very tight knit community, this net community with patients and providers. So I really appreciate that. And I am grateful to be uh, even a part of it from the side and folks are grateful for you as well. As always, we hope this program helped answer some of your questions. I'll reiterate one more time. If you have follow-up questions, please reach out to CCF either here on the Facebook page or at carsonoid.org. Thanks again, as always to our presenting sponsor, Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals. Without them, this, uh, this program wouldn't be possible. And finally, my name is Rain Bennett. Thank you for watching. I have been your host and please join us next time on Luncheon with the Experts. Stay healthy, stay safe, everyone.